Hello friends and welcome to Geopoliticus. In this presentation, we are going to look at Halford Mackinder's paper, Geographic Pivot of History. I will read out the paper and offer my comments as we go along. So Halford Mackinder begins by saying that when historians in the remote future come to look back on the group of centuries through which we are now passing and see them foreshortened as we today see the Egyptian dynasties, it may well be that they will describe the last 400 years as the Columbian Epoch, that is from 1492 to 1900. We will say that it ended soon after the year 1900. Why? Because of late it has been a common place to speak of geographical exploration as nearly over and it is recognized that geography must now be diverted to the purpose of intensive survey and philosophic synthesis, which he will attempt to do. Now, in the last 400 years, in the age of exploration in the Columbian Epoch, the outline of the map of the world has been completed with approximate accuracy. And even in the polar regions, the voyages of Nansen and Scott have very narrowly reduced the last possibility of dramatic discoveries, even as they enter this new age. Now, what makes this new age different? The opening of the 20th century is appropriate as the end of a great historic epoch. On merely on account of this achievement of discovery, great though it be, the missionary, the conqueror, the farmer, the miner, and of late the engineer, have followed so closely in the traveler's footsteps. The world and its remoter borders has hardly been revealed before we must chronicle its virtually complete political appropriation in Europe, North America, South America, Africa and Australasia. There is scarcely a region left for the pegging out of a claim of ownership unless, as a result of war, between civilized or half-civilized parts. Now, even in Asia, we are probably witnessing the last moves of the game was played by the horsemen of Yermak the Cossack who conquered Siberia for Russia in the mid-16th century and the shipmen of Vasco da Gama who was a contemporary of course of Columbus and just when Columbus was discovering the Americas he discovered a trade route to India for the Portuguese. Now, in medieval Christendom, the era before the Columbian Epoch, we may contrast the Columbian Epoch with the age which preceded it, that is medieval Christendom, by describing the essential characteristic of the Columbian Age as one in which Europe expanded against its neighbours with almost negligible resistance, whereas in medieval Christendom, Europe was pent up into a narrow region. So this is the contrast. And in medieval uh, England, it was threatened by external barbarism, whereas in the Columbian Epoch, it was able to expand at the expense of those external barbarians without, as he says, a lot of resistance. Now, from the present time forth in the post-Columbian age, we shall again have to deal with a closed political system. Nonetheless, it will be one of worldwide scope. Now, this is very important because what he says is every social force, every explosion of social force, instead of being dissipated in the surrounding circuit of unknown space and barbaric chaos, will be sharply re echoed from the far side of the globe. And weak elements in the political and economic organism of the world will be shattered in consequence. In the post-Columbian international system, after Europe has expanded across a lot or most of the world, what is going to happen now is that because we are in an international system, if there is an explosion of social forces in one corner of the system, it will have effects across the system. And in fact, just a decade after, Sir Alfred Mackinder delivered his lecture, he saw something similar happening in the First World War. Now why? 
What is the explanation for this? The explanation is given in this analogy. Now, there is a vast difference, he says, of effect in the fall of a shell into an earthwork and its fall amidst the closed spaces and rigid structures of a great building or ship. Now, this is the analogy, the international system in which all of the world's global space has been occupied by nation states or empires is a parallel or is compared to a closed space of a great building in which perhaps these polities are various rooms. Now if a shell was to explode in this closed system, it is going to have an effect that will have repercussions for the entire system as opposed to a shell falling into earthwork where the mud surrounding the explosion will absorb most of the energy from the explosion. Now that is why he suggests that probably some half-consciousness of this fact is at last diverting much of the attention of statesmen in all parts of the world from territorial expansion to the struggle for relative efficiency. And I have discussed this to a large extent in my Art of Geopolitics lectures and the Art of Statecraft lecture. Now, this is important. Here, Sir Alfred Mackinder proposes the outline of his geohistorical thesis that will form the foundation of the rest of his paper. We will just go through the most important points here. So when geographers attempt a philosophical synthesis like they should do and like he is attempting to do for the first time, they should try and develop a correlation between the larger geographical and the larger historical generalizations. So they can develop a formula for understanding the geographical causation in universal history. Now what this formula should do is that it should also be practical, it should be a tool for statesmen. Now, setting into perspective some of the competing forces in current international politics, it should be able to explain the current nature of the current international system. So in this regard, what Sir Alfred Mackinder proposed to do that fine evening was to describe the physical features of the world which he believed to have been most coercive of human action and present some of the chief phases of history as organically connected with them. So he's going to attempt this formula of geographical causation of world history. And uh, he also uh, proposes a limitation into his thesis that he will not stray into excessive materialism. It is man and not nature who initiates. Nature, in large measure, controls. So nature is a stage on which man acts. Now, of course, that stage imposes some kind of broad limitation on the scope of man's movement on it. But ultimately, his movements are his own. And it is the idea of general physical control rather than the causes of universal history that he is going to attempt to developed in his paper going on. Now, another clarification is that a late Professor Freeman held that the only history which counted was that of the Mediterranean and European races. In a sense, uh, Alfred Mackinder challenges this view, although he does it very diplomatically. Now he says, of course, this is true, for it is among these races that have originated the ideas which have rendered the inheritors of Greece and Rome dominant throughout the world. He is, after all, an imperialist, but he is also a geographer attempting to create this new model of universal history. So he says, in another and very important sense, however, such a limitation has a cramping effect upon thought. The ideas which go to form a nation as opposed to the mere crowd of human animals have usually been accepted under the pressure of common tribulation and under common necessity of resistance to external force. Now, this is a key element of his formula of geographic causation of human history. And this is further displayed, evidenced through these historical narratives. Now, the idea of England, he says, was beaten into the Heptarchy by Danish and Norman conquerors. The idea of France was forced upon competing Franks, Goths and Romans by the Huns at Chalons. 
and in the Hundred Years' War with England. The idea of Christendom was born of the Roman persecutions and matured by the Crusades. The idea of the United States was accepted and local colonial patriotism sunk only in the long war of independence. The idea of the German Empire was reluctantly adopted in South Germany only after a struggle against France in combatship with North Germany. Now, the idea of these nations develop in opposition or as a consequence of resistance to foreign invasion. Now, this idea of history, Sir Alfred Mackinder's idea of history is set against or in contrast to the literary conception of history, which concentrates attention upon ideas and upon the civilization which is the outcome. Is a, a, that idea of making a connection just between ideas and the historical course that civilizations take is apt to lose sight of the more elemental movements whose pressure is commonly the exciting cause of the efforts in which these great ideas themselves are nourished. So Sir Halford Mackinder is moving one step back, while literary historians tend to make a correlation between ideas and their consequence on history, Sir Halford Mackinder is stepping backwards and taking a look at the geographical conditions themselves in which ideas are born, and then seeing how this further develops into the course of history that they take. Now, important in this course of history is again, he repeats his idea of a repellent personality performing a valuable social function in uniting enemies. It was under the pressure of external barbarism that Europe achieved her civilization. He asks, therefore, for a moment to look upon Europe and European history as subordinate to Asia and Asiatic history. For European civilization, in a very real sense, was the outcome of the secular struggle against Asiatic invasion. So the idea of Europe was born as a response to Asiatic invasion and in opposition to the threat of Asiatic dominance. Now this is most remarkably displayed in the history of Russia. The most remarkable contrast in the political map of modern Europe is that presented by the vast area of Russia occupying half the continent and the group of smaller territories tenanted by Western powers. Now, from a physical point of view, there is of course a like contrast between the unbroken lowland of the east and the rich complex of mountains and valleys and islands and peninsulas which together form the remainder part of this world. The wider Eurasian world and of course specifically the part which Russia occupies in it, which she's going to look on look at in detail now at first sight it would appear that in those familiar facts we have a correlation between natural environment and the political organization so obvious as hardly to be worthy of description especially when we note that throughout the Russian plain a cold winter is opposed to a hot summer and the conditions of human existence thus rendered additionally uniform. Now, as he moves forward, after giving us the broad outline of his history, now he is going to begin applying the formula that he has developed onto Russia and he set the stage for it. So what he's going to do through a series of historical maps, such as those contained in the Oxford Atlas, he will reveal the fact that not merely is the rough coincidence of European Russia with the Eastern Plain of Europe, a matter of the last hundred years or so, that is of the 19th century, turning into the 20th. But that in all earlier times, there was persistent reassertion of quite another tendency in the political groupings that nations took, that kingdoms and empires took within the region that Russia now occupies. And of course, that region is, the core of that region is the heartland, which again forms the central space of Sir Alfred Mackinder's theory, which he is building towards. Now, this ends part one of our presentation, in which we have discussed the broad geohistorical model that Sir Alfred Mackinder is developing and the justifications and the reasons he gives for it. Now, in part two, we are going to turn towards his more specific 
geographical analysis of or the analysis of geographical causation in the history of Russia. So please uh, stay tuned for that and thank you for watching.